All right, you ready for this? Ready. Salemi, welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Great to have you here. We are closing out on 2021. We have a few things to report before we begin this week's episode, which is going to focus on stroke and hypertension. First, I want to let you know this is our second to last Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We will be back next week with Chris Newmarker, who isn't on today's episode because he's on vacation. And next week should be a jam-packed conversation from our entire editorial staff. So looking forward to bringing you that. Then we'll be off for two weeks. We won't put any podcasts out in the final two weeks of the year. And we'll be back that first Friday of January. We'll be dropping our last Medtronic Talks podcast next week. So if you have not subscribed to Medtronic Talks, please do that. You can find that on the same apps that we put out this podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon. Subscribe to that and that Medtronic Talks episode will be sent directly to you. And finally, we'll have our last 2021 episode of the Intuitive Talks podcast that will come out the week after next. And if you're subscribed to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast, which I certainly hope you are, you'll receive that Intuitive Talks podcast as well. Also, we have our final Device Talks Tuesdays next week, December 14th, 4 p.m. Eastern. This one is sponsored by TE Connectivity. That's right. They are back. And we'll be talking about electrical characterization of high-speed interconnects. I'll be talking with Eugene Majewski. He is the Principal Development Engineer at TE Connectivity. For more information about this, go to devicetalks.com. You can register. You can watch it live on Tuesday. You can watch it on demand. You can just grab the PowerPoint. Whatever you want to do, it's going to be a very informative conversation. Now, let's get into this week's episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. As I said, Chris Newmarker is off today, and I've got a lot of interviews to share, so we're not going to have any sort of news element to this. We're just going to focus on the conversations. So as I've talked about in the past, I like to focus each episode on a specific area. So today, we're looking at stroke and hypertension. To address the stroke part, I brought in Sandra Saldana. She is the CEO of Alva Health. Alva Health won the MedTech Innovators 2021 Global Competition. Very happy to tell you that MedTech Innovator will be part of the upcoming Device Talks Boston. So stay tuned for more information there. But I spoke with Sandra about her path into MedTech and what Alva Health is doing to detect stroke. So Sandra has uh, some great insights on this field. And we talk a bit about how startups can raise money outside of VC. So she's had some great success raising from pitching programs like the MedTech Innovator. So it's great to have Sandra Saldana on the podcast. I'll start that interview in just a moment. But later on, I have a, uh, a real extensive interview with Andy Weiss. He is the CEO and president of Recore Medical, which is one of really the two big renal renovation companies uh, out there, Medtronic being the other. So uh, Andy and I talked for a good long time about his path into MedTech, but also about where renal renovation is headed, why Recore Medical is confident in its path, and what Medtronic's news meant for Recore and meant for the space. And toward the end of the podcast, I'm going to include a part of an interview I did with Jason Weidman. Jason is Senior Vice President at Medtronic and President of Coronary and Renal Dernovation. So he and I talked for a recent Medtronic Talks podcast. You can listen to the entire interview, and I really, really suggest that you do. Jason was a, a joy to talk to. He came into MedTech for the right reasons, and he's just got a, a terrific spirit. So you can find, again, Medtronic Talks on devicetalks.com or on medtronic.com, or you can just subscribe to it and find it on, uh, on any podcast player. And uh, Jason will talk in the Medtronic Talks interview about the rental renovation program more broadly. But the segment of the interview I'm including in today's podcast speaks directly to an AK Medtronic filed in October, where it announced that it would not have the early data that it had hoped to have for its rental renovation program. And uh, we'll talk about what that means. But once again, do find the Medtronic Talks podcast episode with Jason Weidman. It's a really an enjoyable listen. But before we get into rental renovation, 
Let us hear from Sandra Saljanya, the CEO of Alva Health. Well, Sandra Saldana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to, to focus on, uh, on, well, on the stroke area. It's an important place to focus on. It's never great necessarily to, to talk about stroke. It's a dreadful thing, but there's, uh, there's a lot of progress being made, and, and I want to understand what uh, Alva is doing in this fight. But I uh, would love to uh, understand how you came to, uh, to lead this company and, and how you found a, a career into medtech. What, uh, what was your entry point? So I've been in the healthcare space for a long time, right out of, I've always been interested in, in sciences. I, I did a undergrad in, in biology and moved into mm-hmm. a PhD in cancer biology, but I always knew that I wanted to be in business, even though I was diving pretty deep into the sciences. So after my PhD, I, I moved up to Boston um, and I started working for a boutique uh, branding agency that does branding and marketing um, services for medical device and pharmaceutical companies in the Boston region. Well, the, the company is, is worldwide, but uh, I was specifically in the Boston area. So I had a chance to work with a lot of innovators and leaders of, of amazing companies. As you know, Cambridge was uh, was booming at the time and it sure. still is. Um, so um, that was back in 2013. I and mean, I spent about four, four and, a, four and a half or five years there and, you know, kind of Get, getting a sense for the industry, um, getting the bird's eye view of what's going on in innovation. And I really, um, that's where I, I kind of honed in and decided, you know, med tech, medical devices was really the space that I wanted to get into um, just because of how, you know, the timelines are a lot faster to get to market with products and mm-hmm. and you really have a chance to kind of accelerate through, build something to impact patient lives. So that's, that's where I decided I wanted to be in med tech. And how did you come upon uh, Alva as an opportunity? And and did you intend to, were you coming into this opportunity intending to be CEO or how did that uh, take shape? Yeah. So, so I came into the opportunity through, um, you know, while I was at, at my company in Boston, um, I, I applied for the executive MBA program at Yale School of Management. I mean, you know, I wanted I wanted to be in business, but I didn't necessarily have an entrepreneurial network. So I, I went back to school, did an executive MBA and, you know, through there, I learned the basics of business and, mm-hmm. and uh, um, built a network as well of, of other entrepreneurs and people who are in the innovation space. And so that's where um, I was actually working on a different project when I met uh, my co-founders. Um, I was looking at a diagnostic for schizophrenia. Wow. So, so that was, you know, the diagnostic space is, is kind of what I was narrowing down to. But then I met... Kevin and Hatan, who had this new patent they had just filed back in 2016, um, and they were looking for for a business student to help them look at the business side of it and um, figure out if it makes sense to start a company around this technology. Um, so that's where I came in. Mm-hmm. I was, even though I was a scientist previously, I did spend some some years in industry, got you know my MBA, and so. I came into it with uh, with the business mindset, and I I wanted to be on the business side of it. So interesting. I want to get into what Alva does in a, in a moment, but uh, I know Paul Grand and MedTech Innovators done a study with Deloitte, and in it they looked at the number of companies that uh, MedTech companies that are really pursuing diagnostics as opposed to sort of one time therapeutic devices. Uh, was that I wonder how how you looked at at the opportunities. Was diagnostics just something you a diagnostic tool, just something that you happened by, or was there a sort of a conscious decision that I want to get into diagnostics because I'm helping someone before they need it, or because it's a quicker regulatory pathway? Uh, did 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 you did, how did you think about that when you were looking at opportunities? So I guess from my perspective, you know, I, I wanted I knew I wanted to impact patients. And and I'm a little impatient, so I, I you know, coming, <laughs> <laughs> so so coming into it, you know, I was coming from the basic sciences. I did my PhD in in uh, breast cancer, brain metastasis. So I was looking at signaling pathways and what causes breast cancer to spread to the brain. And you know, that was super exciting to be in that space because no one, we were part of the first grant that NIH ever gave for that, you know, for that research area. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, really exciting. I knew I wanted to be in something like that, that was kind of groundbreaking and never been done before. Having said that, it takes many, many years, in some cases, decades to bring a, an innovation from basic science into patients. And so I knew mm-hmm. I wanted to just do something, you know, that was more ready for market. 
So that was kind of my perspective. The other, the other aspect of coming from MD Anderson, where I did my PhD, was um, this idea of personalized medicine. Where at, at the time when I when I did my PhD, that was kind of the hot topic. Is you know looking at an, a patient and an individual as as an individual, you know considering um, what makes their cancer situation unique, and mm-hmm. then putting a team together around um, you know how to tackle that specific individual's cancer rather than chemotherapy, which is just, you know, it's going to kill all the cancer cells and all the, li- uh, all the uh, replicating cells and, and cause a lot of side effects. You know, they, they, they thought we can actually do targeted therapies. We can actually uh, put a tailored team together and use that patient's own data to give them a tailored solution. And so mm-hmm. that's the kind of mindset that I brought into Alva Health, you know, I, I was looking at things from that standpoint. So I wanted to use patients' own data to tailor a solution to help them in, in their individual situation. So this is a great opportunity to, uh, to tell folks what Alva does. You have a, a, a unique wearable and, and one that uh, provides an invaluable service. Tell us about Alva. Yeah. So Alva Health is developing a wearable device for real-time stroke detection using two wristbands containing sensors, a smartphone app, and cloud-based monitoring with machine learning and non-machine learning algorithms. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we look for the onset of hemiparesis, which is one-sided paralysis that is one of the hallmarks of stroke onset. And uh, when we detect uh, hemiparesis, we immediately notify the user. If they don't respond within two minutes, we'll connect them with a trained medical responder who will call 911 and notify the user's emergency contacts. And the purpose is to automate the process of stroke symptom recognition, automate emergency response, and in a seamless way, activate the emergency system around the patient so that the patient themselves doesn't have to be burdened with recognizing the symptoms in a timely manner. We're doing that for them automatically. So what what does the the device look like? It is a a wristwatch or or how does it sit on the person. So it's two wristbands um, that mm-hmm. sit on the wrist on, on the wrists. And um, mm-hmm. so our, our vision is for the wristbands to be as seamless and as non unobtrusive as possible. Um, so, you know, what I always tell people is I want them to look like a live strong bracelet on mm-hmm. the wrist. So, you know, from the outside, it doesn't look like, you know, a medical device necessarily, but it, is, it does have sensors in it. Um, and it's, it's a lightweight, it's, you know, unobtrusive colors and it's water resistant. It's comfortable to wear at night um, so that patients can wear them around the clock during the entire high risk window when they're being monitored. And, and when is that high risk window again? Who are the patients who would be, uh, be using your, your device? So our initial target is going to be patients who were recently diagnosed with a stroke or a transient ischemic attack, because both of these patient populations are now at risk of a recurrent event, particularly within the first 90 days. So about 15% of all stroke patients and, 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 and TIAs uh, recur within, within 90 days, and, hmm. and another 15% recur over a five-year time frame after that initial event. So this is a specific population that is fairly easy to identify because they're coming into the hospital, they're, they're receiving a diagnosis, and in a lot of cases, they're generating an insurance claim. And so we could find these patients. We can pinpoint the moment at which they become high risk for a recurrent event, and we know that the um, stroke recurrence will occur within a specific time window. So that's going to be our initial, initial uh, user. But in the future, after you know, we prove the concept with this acute high-risk population, our goal is to expand out to a much broader population that includes patients who are dealing with hypertension, Mm -hmm. atrial fibrillation, and type 2 diabetes, and other conditions that place them at high risk of of a stroke. And what goes on in the in the back end in terms of the you're wearing the two the two bracelets and sending data from the sending the patient's data to someone who does it go to what are the back office operations look like? Who's, who's looking at the data, monitoring the data? Is it all AI or do you have humans looking at the, at the data that's coming in? So it's both. So initially, mm-hmm. um, the signal, essentially, we're monitoring around the clock. Um, the patient is notified immediately um, if, if something's wrong. It, you know, we give them an opportunity to say, 
I'm actually okay. This is a false alarm. But if they don't mm-hmm. respond, which is going to be the majority of the time, they don't respond within two minutes. We escalate the, the call to a call center where we have trained medical responders who will call the patient and triage the situation, essentially assess if this patient is truly in an emergency situation, call 911, and then notify the, the patient's uh, caregivers or their list of emergency contact. So talk about the, the regulatory pathway. What is, uh, what is required and where are you in the process? So uh, we are most likely going to be regulated as a class two de novo medical device. The wearable itself, um, there, there are predicates out there. Um, and it's a relatively low risk device. You know, it's not non invasive. It's it's um, it's wearable, so it, it doesn't um, really require a lot of um, you know safety validation. But it is a novel indication for use. So no one's ever uh, cleared a medical device for real time stroke detection. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's our process. We're actually in the planning stages of our first. Uh, conversation with the FDA. So we're hoping to have that in Q1 of 2022. Um, and and uh, that's where we, you know, we'll present our plan to the FDA um, and, and uh, propose our, our, our pathway and, uh, you know, get some feedback from the agency and essentially nail down what our validation needs to look like. And, and who ultimately are your, your customers? Are these physicians who are going to be prescribing these? Um, have you, will they require their own reimbursement or are you looking to, to, to sort of save money for providers by eliminating the, the number of strokes that, that occur? It's a mix. So, so this, this is going to be prescribed by physicians, by a stroke mm-hmm. neurologist, potentially other kinds of physicians for high-risk patients. Um, so there is that aspect of going directly to doctors, communicating the clinical validation and, and building awareness that way. Uh, but ultimately, the payer of this technology would be a, an insurance company. So, you know, those folks who are covering for the healthcare of patients who are high risk and they're having strokes, they're currently, there's nothing out there for them. So we have a lot of high risk patients out there right now who are not being monitored. Many of them will have a stroke and then there's no way for them to know exactly when it's happening. And uh, by the time they get to the hospital, it's in a lot of cases going to be too late um, for them to benefit from the available therapies. And so there, there's a, a value proposition there for insurance companies that are responsible for you know, paying these extended hospital stays, the rehab hospitals. We can help them essentially reduce a lot of those costs, improve the outcomes of their populations um, if we are proactive and if we monitor the right patients before they have a recurrence. Excellent. And, and just final question, uh, in terms of uh, raising money, uh, you've been involved, you were involved with the MedTech Innovator Program, you were involved with the, the MedTech Color Pitch Contest. Uh, talk a bit about how you've raised your funds and, and what is it like being the CEO of a startup these days? You're, you're, I see you're pitching a lot. I found some videos online, so it seems like a, there's a lot of opportunities to, to tell your story. Yeah. So we started um, the company in 2017 with uh, a little bit of funding from the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute Summer Fellowship um, at the time. Um, Now it's changed its name to to the Sci City Accelerator. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was kind of how we got started. And we've been funded since day one um, through grants, uh, through pitch competitions and through Mm -hmm. um, things things of that nature. So non-dilutive funding, we um, in 2019, received two phase one SBIR grants. Um, earlier this year, we received a phase two NSF grant. And then as you know, through Paul Grant, we, you know, we did receive that first place, the grand prize in MedTech Innovator, which was 350K. So that was huge for us. Um, sure. you know, we're, we're now up to $2 million in non-dilutive funding. So we've, you know, we've been fortunate that our technology has been recognized, our, you know, our technical approach our, uh, the clinical need has been recognized by government agencies. So we've received support that way. And, and that's essentially what's enabled us to get here today. So, so we're very grateful, you know, for SBIR programs and, uh, and pitch competitions as well. You know, the ability to tell the story in public and, and uh, you know, learning from the audiences and, and from, from accelerators that, you know, this problem that we're solving is important to solve and that people support it and people want to see it succeed, that's been extremely validating for us. But, you know, in, in the future, um, 
we are planning to go out and raise our seed round. Um, mm-hmm. So we're, we're now um, in the planning stages um, of our seed fundraise, and we're going to be opening that soon. Um, and so, so we're excited to to go out there and and get our first. Uh, external private investors in, into the company. That's great. Well, you've demonstrated you can, uh, it's always great to demonstrate you can raise money prior to approaching the people who have more money to invest. So uh, I think you're you're in a good position. So fantastic. Thank you. Sandra Saldana, thank you for joining us on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Tom. It was great speaking with you. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Sandra Saldana. Now I'd like to roll right into the conversation I had with Andy Weiss, the CEO of Recore Medical. Andy and I met a few years ago at another conference I was organizing, and we conducted this interview in late October. So uh, we talked a bit about Medtronic's news, but really focused on Recore, which has an alternative approach to renal innovation. Let's listen. Well, Andy Weiss, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Andy, you and I spoke a few years ago, uh, it was 2017. Uh, a lot has gone on for, for Recore since then. Before we get into Recore's story, though, I'd love to understand how you found your way into the medtech industry. You've been the CEO several times over, uh, but, but where, did it all, where did it all start? Oh, my goodness. I was fortunate um, many years ago um, to have an opportunity to join GE Healthcare um, when it was called uh, GE Medical Systems, and in particular, take a role as a product manager in Paris after we had acquired a French company called CGR. And so in 1989, I moved to France with, at that, my, at that point, we were newlyweds with my wife, Amy, and we uh, each had positions with GE and GE Healthcare in, in Europe. And I spent, you know, three years starting out being the product manager for Low End X-Ray and then going to downstream marketing for Europe, at least in Africa. And I fell in love with the whole healthcare field and was reassigned after three years to GE Healthcare in, in the States. And then, then went to Marquette Medical Systems as VP of Sales and Marketing, and then decided to join a startup called Vital Images. And mm-hmm. That's when I really, things clicked for me where I, was, I went to a startup that was a startup turnaround and I invented the product that they have, and we developed it and took them public. And they ended up being bought by Toshiba. And you know, they're they're a, a viable company. Essentially, twenty years later, selling the same product that I thought up <laughs> many many years ago. That's great. Uh, from there, I was asked to join Medtronic and ran their image guided surgery business. So now I was running about a seventy five million dollar business as. It, it really a standalone business within Medtronic, of which there are very few at that time. Mm-hmm. And then I was asked to run the neuro division, which was deep brain and spinal cord stem and intra- intrathecal drug pumps. The reason I mentioned that is because I then changed from doing diagnosis and 510K devices to therapies. Mm-hmm. So Medtronic gave me the opportunity to experience treating people with Parkinson's disease and essential tremor and chronic pain. And the whole idea of running clinical trials to prove therapeutic efficacy it, you know, with device technology, with, it's the first time I experienced that basically in 2001. And I, I just found sort of, once again, a further refinement of my calling. No, I never really, it's, it's a pretty clear distinction, but uh, the, the distinction between doing something that's visualization or diagnostics versus therapeutic. Is, is that a breakdown in the industry? Do people look at things as a sort of a, as two different categories? And, and yeah. does one bring a different feeling than, than the other? Uh, what was it about therapeutics that really resonated with you? Well, you know, it's, it's, it is very, very different. And uh, if you would like to chat, my, my good friend, Nadim Yara, had experienced the same thing because he was in imaging his whole life. He joined Medtronic to run image-guided surgery to replace me and then went to CVRX. Mm-hmm. So he also experienced the diagnostics, the therapeutic switch. And they are very different because in the diagnostics world, you're dealing with 510Ks. So you're trying to prove that uh, like an imaging device can image and the, image and, the, and the representation of the image is controllable, but you're not trying to say that you, you, know, you therapeutically help the patient. Mm-hmm. And that's a completely different field because with therapeutically helping a patient, now you're looking for patient outcomes, not can I, can I render an image or can I take an MR scan? And 
I love the therapeutic outcomes field. A, I feel a greater connection to helping patients. And, and B, it, it's, um, it is a lot harder, I believe. And um, so, you know, an example is the, uh, the work that we did at Medtronic in, in the neuro division, where we're helping people with Parkinson's disease mm-hmm. and chronic pain and tremor and, you know, trying to understand the benefit and characterize that and work with the FDA it's a much more complicated field, I think. And I think it's, for me, it's more rewarding. Um, And then when I left Medtronic to go to coaxia, I spent eight years trying to treat stroke, ischemic stroke. Mm -hmm. And we, and we ran a very, very difficult trial over seven years and failed. So I, I understand kind of what that's like too. These therapeutic trials are very, very hard to run, especially with devices. And, um, you know, but they can have a great impact on patients' lives. What is that like, uh, spending seven years on, on something that you, I mean, to, to, to spend your time on something, you, you have to believe in it, and you have to ultimately think, I think you, you have a, belief might be the wrong word, but you're, you, you're not doing it because you know it's going to fail, obviously. You think this is going to be something that's going to help people down the road, and to have that not happen. What is that, yeah. at the end of those seven years, how do those seven years feel to you? Like time well spent or time wasted? Well, I, th- I think in the end of the day, designing clinical trials to, to prove safety and efficacy of a therapy, it's very hard. And um, there are some folks that are, that are good at it, and you sort of gain experience along the way. And when I did it at Coaxia, despite the advice of, of people that I trusted, a lot of advice, you know, we ended up spending a lot of time in a, in a trial that failed. Mm-hmm. Now, it, was it the device or the trial design or the outcome measure or the FDA at that time? It's a little of everything. And so, yeah, at the end of seven years, you look back and say, that was a lot of time and effort, a lot of investor dollars, a lot of years of people's lives. And we didn't achieve what we wanted to achieve, which is a therapy that we could you know, offer to patients. So that felt, that felt bad. And in our case, it felt bad because we felt, despite missing the endpoint in our trial, that we demonstrated that we were safe and we had some effectiveness for patients and at that time, the FDA was not open to kind of allowing a device that, at least in our case, in our case, that missed its primary endpoint, but still appeared to show a therapeutic benefit. Mm-hmm. So, no, that didn't feel good. You know, from a, from a more, from perhaps a longer term perspective, I learned a lot and our entire team learned a lot. And in my case, one of our investors who was in an, in a late stage investor in Coaxia, who had basically started Recore asked me to come and run Recore. And, and the message was with all the lessons learned that you've learned from Coaxia and how to design and run therapeutic trials for devices, you know, you're probably the right person to help do this. Mm-hmm. And I would say my ability to help design and lead Recore to, to create positive outcomes with our technology was really informed uh, to a great degree by the lessons we learned at Coaxia. I believe it. But no, I mean, look, at the end of the day, what I feel grateful for at Coaxia is how the team responded to the difficulties, how we stuck with it and fought the fight, in this case with the FDA, until the, until the very end. And uh, it's a pity that our technology is not out there. We, we think it really deserves it. But to run another trial would be impossible with it. So you, you sort of stepped out of the frying pan and into a different, at least a maybe onto a different frying pan when you joined Recor. <laughs> or I don't know if it was quite the fire, but you joined in 2013 as president and CEO. At the time, Rental Innovation uh, was uh, was uh, offered a lot of promise. There was a lot of hope with, with Ardian. And, and we talked previously that there were, there were many other projects in renal renovation, though not as many as people had suggested. There weren't 50. I said 37. You said there weren't 37 when we talked last time, maybe four or five. Uh, how, how did you come to, well, you mentioned the investor connection, but what was it about Recore and renal renovation that appealed to you? Well, I've known the uh, primary investor in Recore, the Sofanova mm-hmm. Partners team, Antoine Peppernick, for you know 10 years, more mm-hmm. than that, and or you know now 15 years. And um, plus, I knew Mono Iyer, the CEO at the time. And when I spoke to both of them, um, it's, you know, my impression was the technology they had was the right technology to treat this. And in my case, it's similar to when I joined Vital Images. They had a unique technology for rendering images called volume rendering. And I said, this is unique. And it can be, I think, differentially, it, you know, better at providing images for radiologists than the other technologies. 
when I looked at the Recore technology, my first impression is that their little tubular ultrasound transducer to use ultrasound to denervate was in many ways the ideal technology, and it would be significantly more effective and faster and more convenient, more reliable than the radio frequency technologies that everyone else was using. Secondly, I, I trusted the, you know, the investor team, uh, the, the CEO at the time, Mono and I are, became good friends, and I felt I could help. Plus, you know, there's no question that treating hypertension would be a tremendous uh, you know, benefit to millions, actually a billion patients worldwide. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I thought, you know, I try to ignore the, the, the irrational exuberance noise that was out there, but focus on the basics. I felt that the recore endovascular technique with ultrasound-based renal denervation would work really well. There was a large unmet medical need. And then the real question is, could we design studies that would show it? that would get physicians to adopt, patients to adopt, payers to pay, and regulators to approve. And so when I joined in 2013, it was, I would say, the irrational exuberance phase where people were, you know, essentially counting on Medtronic's trial to be positive, and then trying to go to market based on their great results. And I think, you know, January 9th, 2014, when uh, they issued a press release and Omar Ishraq said that they failed their primary, mm -hmm. it set the field back, you know, five years. And frankly, in retrospect, you know, to a positive end. You know, I think we learned a lot about trial design from that study. And now the question is, can you apply those lessons to really see if the technology works or not? So how did the, yeah, no, that was, uh, that was a, a certainly a memorable day at the, at the JP Morgan conference. Uh, I remember sitting in front of the, the folks from the foundry uh, in the breakout room and, and they were obviously disappointed and uh, had strong feelings about, about the trial. What lessons, well, I mean, just talk to me about January 10th for you. I mean, are you sitting at this yeah. company saying, uh oh, <laughs> uh, there goes yeah, the field, yeah. or are you are you immediately seeing an opening uh, it, it, for you to run through? Well, um, if I go back to January tenth, twenty fourteen, I think you know the you know the, the basics were pretty clear. Medtronic is a, an influential company. We're all looking forward to their data, and you know we at Recore were a tiny little company with like twenty people and on a shoestring budget, and we knew that um, our ability to go raise money would pretty much stop because the, the world would look and say, if Medtronic failed, then all these other projects, mm -hmm. you know, will fail too. And then you may recall that in the six months following that, you know, most, if not all of the other projects were canceled, whether they were by Abbott or j, &J or Boston, et cetera. And the, the good news is that the FDA under Bram Zuckerman uh, got, gathered everyone together in June of 2014 and said, you know, we don't think that the failure in the Medtronic trial means renal denervation doesn't work. It means that some combination of their device and their trial design, you know, that didn't work. And secondly, Medtronic didn't really release the why it failed till I think PCR or ACC later that year. And when we saw the primary publication and we started to look into the why, then we realized that to a great degree, their failure had to do with how their trial was designed and run. So we, we, um, we had been developing relationships with the folks that we thought were the most rigorous hypertension trial designers around. And one of them is a brilliant physician named Michelle Azizi in Paris. Another one is Felix Mafud in Hamburg. Third one is Laura Mori, who at the time was in Harvard, and Ajay Kirtani at Columbia. And basically with, with Michelle and Felix and others, we said, Let's design trials that can demonstrate whether or not the, these technologies work in hypertensive patients. And we want to learn from all the trials that you guys have ever been involved with, especially the hypertension trials. And we looked at the Medtronic information and we came with a few basic principles. One of them is you got to have a population of people that, that you can evaluate. And so they have to have normal everyday hypertension, not from other odd causes. Secondly, Hypertensive patients go on and off their medications all the time. Mm -hmm. So you've got to control their meds because if they go on and off their meds, then you can't have a reliable outcome. Thirdly, you have to have a reliable treatment strategy, meaning you have to know where you're going to quote ablate and you have to do that according to the instructions for use every time. The doctor at the hospital 
has to know that and you have to help them with that. And thirdly, you have to have a reliable, fourth, you have to have a reliable outcome measure, which is called ambulatory blood pressure monitor. And we apply those four basic principles, good population, good treatment strategy, medication control, and ABP outcome. We were confident that we would show whether our technology worked or not. Mm-hmm. And, and then we went run trial in a group of patients that were only on, you know, zero, one or two meds. And we could take them off their meds. And the way to control the meds on that group no meds, no antihypertensive meds. So there was no confounder from the meds. The other group, patients were on three or more meds. And there we put them on a single pill, a poly pill with three meds in it. And we did urine tests on them, right? So we had two trials that were independently powered, running in parallel, one solo, where the only treatment was our device, hence the name solo, and the other trio, which was on the triple mm-hmm. pill, hence the name trio. <laughs> And we ran both those trials in parallel and boom, both are positive. Big statistical difference, major blood pressure reductions, you know, with clinical benefit and no safety issues. And when we designed those trials, we basically went around to payers and say, not payers, investors and said, here's the right program to see if this works or not. Is this the kind of program? It's a serious program. It'll take years that you want to invest in. And most everyone said, no, (laughs) they said, they said, they said, Medtronic failed. How can you succeed? (laughs) And we said, because we have the right technology, the right trial design. And thank goodness, we came in contact with Atsuka. Mm -hmm. And Atsuka said, we love your technology. The trial design makes sense. We're in. And we started to get a series of investments from Atsuka. And, you know, then you and I met in 2017, we were running these two trials and we didn't know the outcomes yet. And we announced the outcome at PCR of of the solo trial in 2018, big blood pressure drop, statistically significant. And then, you know, basically 90 days later, Atsuka acquired us. I remember the conditions of the, the, uh, of the uh, financing were, were uh, unique in that Atsuka had basically acquired the rights for, uh, I think, sales in, in all of Asia, I believe. For Asia, yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, it was very much a, a pharma sort of uh, arrangement, I assume. Right. The, 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 that we, I, at the time, I wondered if we'd see more of that. Have you ever seen more of those structured deals? Because I was really fascinated by that. It made a lot of sense. Well, I'm a big believer in put a syndicate together who can carry you through. Yeah. Right. And in our case, with renal denervation, with the Medtronic failure, that was impossible. We had Sofanova, who'd put a lot of money in, and we knew we need a lot of money in years to get through these two trials. And in this case, Atsuka, I would say somewhat uniquely, had decided that they wanted to build a new division, a, a medical device division. Mm-hmm. And there are very few Japanese medical device companies. You know, Terumo comes to mind, of course. And so they had a strategic intent, which is to build a device division. And they were happy to put small amounts in and invest step by step and then put more in if the, if the technology and the team was successful. Now, I haven't seen that in other Japanese pharma companies. I haven't really seen that in other pharma companies. I think Atsuka in this case has been somewhat visionary and unique in that sense because they made a decision to complement their consumer and pharma businesses they want a third leg. They wanted devices. And when they when they came across us, I'd say they came across an undervalued asset. Mm-hmm. So here's a technology that could address a global 1 billion patient condition. It, in some ways, it, it complemented their pharma business. And they were willing to make strategic investments long term. They were definitely not a financial investor from day one. They wanted to see this succeed. And if they did, they wanted to own it. And so once Solo came through, despite the fact that they had Asian distribution rights, I said to them, now we know it works. I have to raise $250 million to grow this thing. Mm -hmm. So either you have to do it or you can acquire us or I need to go and get investment from other companies and then you'll basically lose all your control Mm -hmm. because someone else will out invest you. And they were pretty quick to come back and say, we like your team. We like the technology. We believe in this and we're going to do it. And then they, they had a, they had a a purchase option. They exercised that and they've been investing heavily in the business and we're up to almost 150 people and running multiple programs at the same time, 
due to Atsuka's, you know, vision and support for what we're doing. So you're, you're now operating as a, as a wholly owned subsidiary of Atsuka, but you're Correct. still, you're still Since recording. July of 18. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's just, just back up a few steps. How is your technology or approach different than, uh, than Medtronic's formerly Ardians? Uh, I imagine there must be some differences because there's, you can't yeah. do, you can't do things identically. We have an ultrasound transducer, which stays in the center of the artery. It never touches the artery and it just sends out sound waves. And when the sound waves go into the tissue, they get absorbed. The absorption of the sound waves is called attenuation. And when the tissue absorbs the sound waves, they turn it into heat. And certain frequencies of sound waves, you know, heat some tissue more or less than others. Sound waves going through water don't heat the water up at all. But in gel-like tissue, like where the nerves are, or the interstitial tissue, that gets heated up. Hmm. The second thing is our transducers in a balloon, and we can circulate water in the balloon. So the balloon contacts the artery. So even though the artery is absorbing some of that sound and getting hot, we suck the heat right out with the balloon in the cooling water. It's like the radiator in your car. So by adjusting the power of the ultrasound transducer and the flow rate of the water and the trans, the balloon, we can cool the artery and still heat outside the artery. Mm -hmm. So our arteries actually stay cooler than normal because we use room temperature water. It's cooler than your body. We cool down the artery and we heat the tissue beyond it. So we can heat circumferentially and we can ablate for about a five millimeter long section of tissue and we can ablate out to six, seven, eight millimeters where the nerves are. And so our technology is unique. It doesn't contact the wall. We can ablate more deeply out to six, seven, eight millimeters, and we always cool the arterial wall. And uh, our ultrasound energy is a high amount of energy. So the ablation takes seven seconds, whereas with RF, it's usually a minute. Okay. So we do three seven-second ablations on, in each of the two main renal arteries, 42 seconds, and we're done. So our latest procedure, our first sort of commercial procedure in Europe, uh, it was in and out in 30 minutes, skin to skin, and the total ablation time was, you know, 40 seconds. Wow. So it's fast. We preserve the artery. We ablate circumferentially. We get deep. We trait in the main renal artery. And thus far, it's we have had a good safety profile. We'll see how our, our other studies come out. And we've had two trials with positive clinical outcomes. All right. Well, let's talk about the, the progress then that the company's made. In, in 2018, you uh, announced positive results from the Radiance Trio study, and you got breakthrough device designation for your Paradise ultrasound renal denervation system. So the, the Trio, what, can you, a few takeaways from the Trio study and what's the significance yep. of the breakthrough device designation? So first of all, in 2018, we announced the SOLO trial. Okay. All right. And the SOLO trial, if you recall, are, are patients that ha are on zero, one, or two, one or, or two meds and, you know, they, we take them off their meds. So the only thing we're testing is our treatment versus no treatment. Mm -hmm. And that was positive, And that triggered the acquisition. The TRIO trial, patients are deemed resistant to medical therapy. And we demonstrate that by giving them a triple pill. And they're still hypertensive. And then we randomize them. That's the one that read out this year in 2021 at, at PCR and ACC. So the TRIO trial was very hard to enroll. We finished it. We did apply to the FDA last year for breakthrough designation and were awarded that. So now we have positive solo, positive TRIO and breakthrough. And we're going through the path now of our, of our pivotal trial, which we call Radiance 2. Mm -hmm. Radiance 2 is designed to give us more efficacy and more safety data. It's, it's uh, designed to, for 225 patients, randomized two to one. And it's in a population very similar to solo. It's solo patients. These are patients on zero, one, or two meds, but uncontrolled. So we take them off their meds and randomize them two to one. And we're at about 170 out of 225 now. And that trial was largely stopped for months because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And like, like Medtronic, like many others, we, you know, COVID was, you know, in many ways, a disaster for the world many, many ways. And it was really a problem for companies like us that are running clinical trials. As soon as we saw COVID taking off, March 13th of 2020, we stopped all our clinical trials. 
we felt it was unethical to ask patients to go to hospitals for a study. Mm -hmm. And it would put our people and the care providers in harm's way. And this is before we had vaccines. So we basically stopped our trials for three, four, five months and slowly, you know, put protocols in place to be able to restart them. And the FDA did a great job. They said, please let us know how these COVID uh, pandemics are, are affecting your trials and how they might affect the outcomes. And I know Medtronic has pointed to this in their recent releases, and we've been uh, dealing with it as well. We were very fortunate to be able to finish TRIO in February of 2020. And we stopped early knowing that COVID was likely to be a very long problem and continuing TRIO in a COVID environment didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And we paused Radiance 2. And so to make a long story short, since then, we restarted Radiance 2. We enrolled another 100 patients since COVID started. And we're looking forward to finish Radiance 2 in the first half of next year. And we are in the started the process of submitting for our PMA approval. We're uh, we're using a modular approach, and we've submitted the first module, and we hope to keep submitting those modules and have full submission by the middle of next year. So we're, you know, we are we remain very enthusiastic about our technology. Uh, we remain confident that our trials provide good data. Mm -hmm. And we're hopeful that Radiance 2 will be positive and we'll have a really exciting submission to the FDA. What, what neither you know, Medtronic knew nor Recor knew going into COVID is how COVID would affect things. Naturally, we're concerned about COVID because people's stress levels are higher. That affects blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Our ability to monitor patients went way down. So we have a bunch of folks that we enrolled pre-COVID and a bun bunch during COVID, but pre-vaccine. And then we'll have another cohort that was with COVID and vaccines. And we'll just have to see how those three different groups really, you know, respond to the therapy. And um, at this point, we will, you know, we're, we're going to be as Zen-like as we can, focus on very, very high levels of study quality. And hopefully we'll finish and look at those results in the first half of next year. And hopefully they'll be positive. If not, we'll try to figure out what they mean. Excellent. And I, I'm not sure why I said it was 2018. Clearly it was 2020 uh, sure, for, for your breakthrough. Uh, and, and this year, actually this month, October, we're speaking uh, in mid-October, you launched your uh, paradise system in Europe, correct? Your commercial there now? Yes. So, uh, you know, October was a big month for Recor in a couple of ways. The, I would say the most important one is that after seeing the solo data and the trio data, trials that we have confidence in the outcomes and the European societies are now starting to recommend the use of renal denervation for the routine care of patients with hypertension, mm -hmm. we made the decision for the first time to allow our technology to be used outside of clinical trials. And I know some people say, oh, look, it's your first commercial case. To me, the most important thing, it's the first case that we felt the data supported at least in Europe, where we have CE Mark, that we can start allowing the device to be used for routine care. And a number of our clinical study centers in Europe have been asking for that for some time, but we've said, no, we, we're waiting for the evidence to really support it and um, consensus statements from the societies to support it. And that's what's happened now. So we will start a very limited commercial release starting in Germany, moving to Switzerland and step-by-step step to the other countries in Europe. And we hope that the device will, you know, the centers of excellence for hypertension will start adopting it. Mm -hmm. And yes, that'll start the commercial process for us. Remember that in Europe and certainly the United States, there's no reimbursement or coverage for this technology. So the use we think is going to be very, very small. It'll be limited to those patients where physicians say they have no other options and they're willing to go get prior authorization from payers or pay out of just discretionary funds. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a big step for patients and hopefully it will build and build and build over time. In this regard, you know, the Medtronic um, miss in their interim is very disappointing because you know, positive outcomes in their trial can help support the field so that patients can get access because payers will pay. That their, their delay of a year will really have biggest impact will be delaying you know, payers and, and, and physicians to be able to see positive results 
uh, to support the field growing. It, the good news is that we have two positive trials. Hopefully when Radiance 2 comes out in, in, in the first half of next year, that that'll be a third trial with our technology and it'll support the field growing. Uh, I, I want to follow up on that point about Medtronic in a moment, but I just wanted to quickly ask about uh, your required trial results that you presented in Japan. What was the, uh, right. those were, those were, uh, you missed, you missed the, uh, the mark there, right? Those were negative as well. Yeah. So in, in, you know, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, there were two major events in, Oct- in October for us and the required trial what the, um, failed to meet its primary endpoint. And that was announced almost a year ago, uh, December of 2020. And um, in, in, to make a very long story short, it fell prey to exactly the same problems that Medtronic's HTN3 trial fell prey to. Mm-hmm. In, and to make a long story short, um, our, our colleagues at Itsuka who ran the trial <clears throat> did not adequately control medications in their patients. Mm-hmm. So they had patients on different numbers of medications, different types of medications, and there was no adherence testing. So the patients, in our our view, when we do root cause analysis, they were going on and off their meds in in both the treatment and the sham arms, and it confounded the results. And what that means for folks, I hope people really understand that. It means that the, 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 the results are in essence uninterpretable because there's another factor that's changing the patient's blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It's they were going on and off their meds. So you don't know if their blood pressure went up or down due to the meds or the device. So the results really like Medtronic's HTN3 trial, they're just uninterpretable. So it was a major effort by our colleagues in Atsuka. I think they did a, you know, they did a really good job, but they designed it based on the design criteria that were like pre 2013 mm-hmm. while we moved forward with the Azizi, Laura Mori, you know, approach. And they just didn't do that. And unfortunately the outcomes, you know, are a result of that. But the, the fact that do, do those, does that patient population that, that is taking multiple uh, different types of doses, different types of medication, sometimes missing their medication, does that represent, sort of the real world conditions and is a fact that, well, I don't know, is, is, it, is it unfair to say that the mental innovation didn't work in that regard? It's maybe perhaps fair, fair to say that you just can't measure its success because it's in a clinical trial. My, I guess my question is, can mental innovation work in a, a real world environment where you have right. many different types of people not taking their meds, right. taking this med or right. that med? What? Right, right. No, that's exactly the right question, Tom. I mean, here, here's, I think, how I look at it. And I think this is the right way to look at it. When you're, when you're hypertensive and you, try, and you take these meds, you might take one, two, or three, or four meds, right? Mm-hmm. And each one may lower your blood pressure, say, five millimeters of mercury, maybe seven, something like that, right? So, you know, if, if one of them is giving you side effects, dry cough, ankle selling, you have to pee all the time, or, you know, they're, they're, these are notable size effect, side effects. So after a few months, you go, I'm not going to go to the pharmacy. I won't take that one. Your blood pressure goes up five millimeters, or if it's two of them, it'll go up 10 millimeters. So our devices seem to drop blood pressure, or at least the Medtron, the Recore one appears to about, you know, 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So if you get our device, right, and your blood pressure drops and you go, okay, I'm going to stop taking my meds because I, because they, I have negative side effects, your blood pressure will go back up, mm-hmm. right? The, the renal denervation is not a panacea. It's an additional treatment option. And you can, you can negate its response. You know, it'll, it'll lower blood pressure and then you stop taking your meds. It goes back up again. Alternatively, if you're in one of these trials and let's say you got the sham treatment and you say, you're taking your blood pressure at home and you go, Hey, my blood pressure is not going on down. I'm going to start taking my meds again, even though the protocol says don't, and then all of a sudden the sham patient's blood pressure drops because they went on their meds. So you could have in the treatment arm patients going off their meds and mm-hmm. in the sham arm people going on, and it basically makes a mess of the outcome data. The renal denervation still works. It's just its effect is masked by the fact that patients are going on and off their meds. Now, the, the reason we think this is true is that in solo and trio, we see the results of the device without you know, adherence problems. Mm-hmm. In, in the solo trial, they're not on any meds and boom, their blood pressure went down and the sham patients didn't. And with trio, same thing. 
the treated patients, boom, their blood pressure went down and the sham patients didn't. And if they did, you can see it in adherence testing Mm -hmm. with the urine and blood. So um, in the real world, I believe what happened, what could happen is let's say you're a physician and you have a patient that's on two meds or three meds and they're still, their blood pressure is uncontrolled. You can say to them, with this treatment, you have a chance of having your blood pressure drop 10 millimeters. Maybe you can then go off a med or maybe you don't have to go on the next med, Mm -hmm. but let's, let's, let's make sure that you stay stable on your meds. The other thing is when I talk to hypertension specialists around the world, the biggest problem they struggle with is patients' adherence to the medications. There are lots of meds out there and yes, they have side effects, but the biggest issue is can their patients stay on them for the rest of their lives? And that's a really, really hard thing. We're hopeful that with renal denervation, you get the treatment, it's durable, it's on 24 hours a day. And if you can go off a med or two, your ability to adhere to fewer meds is much higher. So we think it's a major benefit and it's just hard to study. Interesting. F- final Sorry for such a complicated. Uh, no, no, I, it, it's a, it's a, it's the right way to look at it, and it, it's helpful to have that perspective. Uh, the final thing I just want to hit upon. I know you've had a, spent a lot of time with us. I appreciate it. Uh, it's just that you referenced earlier, sort of following Medtronic, or at least Medtronic is really driving the. Uh, it seems to be the, the the engine that's driving this this special, even though they don't have a, a, approval yet or, or the clinical data that they need. But people are looking at, at them as the as the bellwether. Uh, how, how does that impact you? How has it helped or not helped? Because in some instances, you're told that it's best to be first. You can sort of you can blaze a trail. You can you can f- learn the lessons that you need to learn before your competitors do. But it seems as if everyone is just distracted by what's happening at the uh, at the big player and maybe is is missing what's happening at Recor. You know, it's it's another really good question. So um, I worked at Medtronic for a number of years and it's a great company with great people, um, very strong ethics, commitment to science. And so I have great respect for them. And naturally, we you know, we encountered their trials at our clinical study centers and some of our PIs and, and uh, in trial investigators are also trialing the Medtronic technology. So um, we have great respect for them and what they're doing. But also there's no question that they've got, um, you know, a tremendous amount of awareness in, the, in, in medical, you know, fields around the world. Sure. And um, I think what Recor has done over the last seven years is we've developed a very strong uh, and positive reputation and rapport with the thought leaders in the field. They've seen the quality of our technology and the quality of our trials and the commitment and the quality of our people who've run them. So if you look at the key opinion leaders in, in renal denervation in the United States and Europe and, and, to, and in Japan as well, I think Recor's aware, brand awareness and reputation is at the highest level of anyone in the world. So I think that we are, you know, you know, co-leaders with Medtronic in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, the the Medtronic miss at their at this interim analysis. I think the 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 folks that are knowledgeable in the field, the physician community, they understand that these trials are just hard to run. One of my investigators just texted me after this. He goes, "On Med trials are hard and hard in all caps. They're just hard," and so. I think people understand the Medtronic's miss and are excited for them to be positive a year from now. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, you know, on the other hand, so we were, yes, indeed, expecting Medtronic would be six to 12 months ahead of us in the field, but we also counted on our strong reputation and the strength of our technology and our data. So as Medtronic was, you know, would take their device to market, build the market, we would be, you know, right behind them. In this case, you know, we're, we're still hopeful our pivotal trial will be positive and that we can march down the PMA path. And now it looks like we may be kind of aligned in timing with them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's fine too. I would say the only, the only negative with regard to Medtronic having failed this is, it, you know, some people once again will question whether or not renal denervation really is a thing or not. Right. And I think that we, the only thing we can do is point to our data and, and ask the key opinion leaders in the field 
to comment and educate and write about, you know, yes, it is real and the treatment effect is real, but these things are just very, very hard to study and be patient, wait for the, med, the Recore Radiance 2 data and the Medtronic on med data and don't close your mind. Um, it is, it, it's, uh, I think, I was hoping that 2022 would be a big year for growth. I think it'll be another year of kind of waiting for the data to come out. Mm-hmm. And we're hopeful that ours will come out at PCR and hopefully Medtronics will come out next year at TCT. So hopefully second half of next year will be a big year for patients and a big year for the field. Well, that's a, it's a hopeful way to end this. I, I appreciate the, the honesty and the insights. Uh, thanks for, for joining us on the podcast. Always a pleasure. Thanks. All right, it's great to have Andy Weiss on the podcast. I really enjoy talking with him. And as I said, I like talking about renal renovation. So to continue that conversation, again, I'm going to run an excerpt from an interview I did with Jason Weidman of Medtronic, who leads that company's rental renovation program. We talked more broadly in the interview you can find on the Medtronic Talks podcast. But in this clip, we'll talk specifically about Medtronic's news in October, about why it missed its mark and about where the program is headed. Let's listen. So let's talk a bit about uh, the AK that came out uh, last month. And well, I think it was in October. I'm trying to remember where I am on the calendar now. Yeah, I know there was there was hope that you'd have some positive news to share at TCT. Then the then the AK came out, and the and the news wasn't what you expected to be. Can you talk about what where things fell fell short and and where you're going from here? Yeah, sure. Good, good question, Tom. And I and I think um, let me provide a, a little bit of context for it sure. so that um, the, the listeners can understand. So I mentioned we have this huge clinical trial program and in, you know, more specifically our clinical program for FDA approval, it, it consists of four randomized sham controlled studies. So those were both uh, in the presence and absence of blood pressure lowering medications. Uh, and then we also have a very large real world data set. So at this point, now we have three of those four sham controlled studies are successfully complete and have shown the technology and procedure are safe and, and that it works. That real world data set, which we call um, the Glo- Global Simplicity Registry, has enrolled 3,000 patients, I- including many of those at, at high risk, so high risk patient groups. And we've seen a really strong and consistent blood pressure lowering effect in that trial. And, and what's great is 2,500 of those patients are now out to three years. And so that, that effect has been sustained out to three years. And so everything at this, at this point, everything so far looks great. So all that's left to finish is that final, that number four out of four uh, sham controlled study. And so that's the spiral on med trial. And, and so it's this trial, the on med trial that was the subject of the, of the 8K that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And so um, the, the, the OnMed trial is a, a Bayesian design. So going back to your, your question about complex trials, it's a, it's a super complex trial. It's a particular flavor of Bayesian that's, that's new and novel and hasn't been used in medical devices before. And, and it includes um, pre-specified interim looks that allow you to stop the trial early if certain criteria are met. So essentially, if the results are better than expected or, or better than what we planned for when we designed the trial, um, you can stop it early. And uh, this was pretty widely known in the financial community um, that we had one of these pre-specified looks here early in October. And, and given that our early pilot results uh, for OnMed were, were really strong, there was a lot of hope that we could see better than expected results and end the trial early. Well, we heard back in, uh, in October from our independent uh, data safety monitoring board. So we don't look at the data ourselves. We're completely blinded to it. And what that independent board told us is that they recommended that we continue trial enrollment, that we should continue as planned and continue until the full sample size is reached. So the 8K was, was simply an update to the financial community on timing. And we put it out there to maintain our transparency on, on what's going on with the program. So where do we, uh, where you go fr- from here? What uh, do you, have you said when you may be able to provide the, the update that that's necessary to sort of close the loop on, on the trials? Yeah, yeah, we have. And, and so um, we expect that we'll have data uh, some, by the end of uh, next calendar year, sometime by the end of next calendar year. So we just have to finish enrollment in the trial, which we're kind of on that last lap. And then there's a six month um, uh, follow up period to the primary endpoint. We'll have those data sometime next year. And and how do you as a, as a 
as a business person building this business up, what does that do for your plans in terms of ramping up for hopefully, ultimately, commercialization? Do you put things on hold? Do you do you still sort of build with a, with an approval in mind? What what's going on in that in that area? Yeah, I, it's a good question, Tom. And I, I think what's most important is that the timing impact doesn't. It, um, or the timing update doesn't impact our confidence and our high confidence in Ardian at all. So mm-hmm. this is just a trial that's not complete. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we have a ton of clinical evidence on this therapy already that's all pointed in the same direction, and that's positive. So we're, we're certainly not um, holding up things that are time sensitive. Uh, we continue to advance our plans. Um, but there are also other things that you do only when you're very close to approval. So let's say as you're starting to to supplement your field force or put particular field facing roles in place, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to put those in you know, two years in advance. So, so things like that, we would hold off on. Excellent. It's a great story. As I said up top, I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a fanboy of the technology. And, and, and I do give credit to Medtronic for sticking with it because I think you folks are really, I think this market's future sort of hinges upon this program. There are other companies out there that are doing it, but even they're looking to you to sort of open some doors and 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 and, and blaze a trail. Um, I asked you this before, and you said it's fun, and I think that's great. But what is it? How does it feel to be? To, to, you've joined an industry where you wanted to make a difference. You're in position to make a huge difference uh, if things go go well. Uh, what's it like going to work every day, knowing that's that's sort of the uh, the, the likely, hopefully, outcome. Uh, I, I mean, it is, like I said, exactly what I've wanted to do. It's exciting for me to get up every day. Um, I, mean, I, I actually wish there were maybe 36 hours in this day instead of 24 <laughs> hours a day because there would be more time to spend on it. I just really get super excited about the prospect of, like I said earlier, about transforming how hypertension is treated. And, you know, I think it's because it, we've, you know, you and I were talking about this, it's such an enormous problem. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you look at the facts, more than a billion people worldwide have high blood pressure. It costs our healthcare systems about $400 billion annually. It's, uh, it's the largest contributor to death. However, despite all of this, um, what we have today just isn't working. Mm -hmm. So less than one in five people have their blood pressure under control. So it's less than 20%. And this is just so sad because small, small reductions in blood pressure make a big difference on health outcomes. So, so a drop of just two millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure. So when you go to the doctor and you get that cuff and they measure it, they give you those two numbers, that top number, if that goes down by just two points, that results in a 10% reduction in stroke and a 7% reduction in ischemic heart disease mortality over a patient's lifetime. Wow. So contemplate that. It, it, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it's such an opportunity for us. And, and what's, you know, also sad about this is that drugs do work. It's just people don't take them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so if you look at the data and there's tons and tons of studies out there on, on drug compliance, only about half of people are fully compliant with their blood pressure drug regimen at a year. And a full... 20% of them don't take anything at all. Wow. So we desperately, desperately need more tools to treat high blood pressure and, and so do patients. And, and I truly believe, as does our organization, that Ardian is one of those potential answers. And it has the, the, the possibility to fill that void because it's, it's, you know, we think of it as always on. There's mm-hmm. no need to worry about taking pills every day. It's just a one-time procedure. It appears that it's durable. Um, it's not going to get rid of medications for all patients but it's going to, uh, it's going to serve a, a great purpose for many. That's fantastic. And, and just final question and sort of circling back to my question about your, your path into med tech, you are an engineer. You went to Stanford at like 97. I joked about the dot-com thing. I, I wonder if you could speak to other engineers out there. I mean, you're, you have a lot of engineers who go into industry where they don't have to deal with an FDA and clinical trials and, and everything you need to do to prove that the work you're doing uh, is, is effective. What is it about, for you as an engineer that, that has made, uh, made work in the medical device field. So, uh, so, so worthwhile. And, uh, and what would you tell future engineers like my son, who's 16 and looking at this industry would, or looking at a technical industry, what would you say to young people who want to apply their technical skills? What would you say about the medical device industry? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Tom. And, and I think it kind of comes back to some of the earlier things we talked about, which is, 
you know, you want to pick a career, whether it's engineering or anything else in an industry that gets you excited to wake up and come to work every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what better place to do that when you can bring your inventiveness and your ingenuity and your technical skills to improve people's health. And, um, and you can see that directly. You can see that direct impact of what you're making and what you're designing uh, on, on people's health. That's fantastic. Well, this is a, a great conversation. Uh, now I'm a fan of you as well as, as renal Innovation. So uh, thanks, Tom. <laughs> I appreciate the insights. And, uh, and we'll be tracking this story. I'm sure we'll be talking again next year. Uh, I'm sure to talk about some, some, some positive news. So thanks for joining us on the podcast, Jason. Okay. Thanks so much, Tom. All right, that is a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Once again, we'll have one more podcast episode out next week, so stay tuned for that. Please do us a favor, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss next week's or any future episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. And you'll also have the Intuitive Talks Podcast sent directly to you as well. Please do share this episode on social media. And when you do, connect with me. I am on LinkedIn and I am on Twitter. On Twitter, you can find me at MedTechTom. You can find Chris Newmarker on LinkedIn as well. His last name is spelled Newmarker as in a new marker. You can find him on Twitter at Newmarker. Finally, don't forget to join us on Tuesday at 4 p.m. for our final Device Talks Tuesday program brought to you by TE Connectivity. That's a wrap. Tune in next week for our final 2021 episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. 